The BBC, or to use the organisation's full name, the British Broadcasting Corporation, is the UK's state broadcaster. As such, the BBC has a huge media output. I'd say the largest in the whole country. The BBC runs the UK's largest terrestrial television channel, as well as several other channels on both terrestrial and cable television. And it also has the largest radio network in the UK, as well as a large internet presence. The BBC also exports much of its media output across the whole world. And for those living outside the UK, we really need to explain the way the BBC is funded. The UK has a TV licence. In other words, UK residents have to pay an annual fee. And by fee, we essentially mean a tax, in order to have the legal right to own a television. And this money goes to the state broadcaster. The BBC makes £3.74 billion a year in licence fees, and a further £1.08 billion a year in commercial revenue giving the corporation a total annual income of nearly £5 billion. You can view these figures in the BBC's financial report. It's linked in the description below. But what about those who don't pay their TV licence? Well, every year, more than 180,000 people in the UK are charged with not paying their TV licence, and prosecutions for not paying a TV licence currently account for around 10% of all criminal cases in England and Wales. More than 99% of those convicted of not paying their TV licence receive a fine of up to £1,000, which nets the government almost £30 million a year. So bearing in mind, the BBC milks billions every year from the general public in the form of a tax, you would think the state broadcaster would have to be impartial, especially in terms of politics. Well, the BBC has a charter which has a section on impartiality. I read this from that charter and I quote, Impartiality lies at the heart of public service and is the core of the BBC's commitment to its audiences. It applies to all our output and services, television, radio, online, and in our international services and commercial magazines. We must be inclusive, considering the broad perspective and ensuring the existence of a range of views is a proportionately reflected. The agreement accompanying the BBC Charter requires us to do all we can to ensure controversial subjects are treated with due impartiality in our news and other other output dealing with matters of public policy or political or industrial controversy. But we go further than that, applying due impartiality to all subjects. End quote. So maybe, if one was naive, they would think that the BBC was impartial in terms of politics, that they wouldn't take sides, and that the BBC had to represent all political parties and cover all political events in a fair and open manner. Which is, of course, what would be in the public's interest. The same public that is forced to give the corporation over £3.7 billion every year. Well, anyone thinking that would be wrong. The BBC have a long and shameful history of hand-picking audiences for political shows to ensure the audience has the correct and state-approved viewpoints. And the BBC also has a notorious history of choosing guests for discussion panels that only represent politically correct or liberal views. The BBC also has a long history of supporting mass immigration, multiculturalism and globalism, and pushing for the acceptance of every degenerate lifestyle imaginable. As such, the BBC has held a strong bias against patriotic political parties and a bias in favour of the Labour Party, the UK's largest left-of-centre party. But what has happened recently completely exposes this bias, as the BBC have refused to cover a police investigation into suspected electoral fraud that has been allegedly committed by a Labour Party candidate in relation to this year's elections. But this isn't just any candidate. This candidate is Dan Jarvis. Dan Jarvis is the Member of Parliament for Barnsley Central and former Shadow Cabinet Minister of Justice. 
and this year he is also standing for Mayor of the Sheffield City Region. And this election isn't inconsequential. It's actually the largest election to take place this May in the whole of Britain. And an election that has had extensive media coverage. But why are the police investigating Dan Jarvis for electoral fraud? Well, it's all down to his election paperwork that was submitted by himself, his election agent, or a combination of the two. In the statement of persons nominated as a candidate in the election, Dan Jarvis has listed the non-existent address of 76 Marsham Road, London, as his home address. No postcode is provided for this address. What's more, this address simply does not exist. There is a 76 Marsham Road in Kingsheath, Birmingham, and there is a 76 Marsham Street in London. However, the latter address is a Barrett Luxury Flat development. But there is no 76 Marsham Road in London, meaning that Dan Jarvis's election paperwork features a fictitious address. It therefore seems that Dan Jarvis has made a false declaration on his election paperwork, and if that is the case, that false declaration would amount to electoral fraud, which upon conviction would most probably get him disqualified from holding elected office and would therefore have serious repercussions for Dan Jarvis and for the Labour Party. Not only would Dan Jarvis be forced to step down as mayor of the Sheffield City region if he was to win the seat, but he would also be forced to stand down as MP for Barnsley Central too, causing the Labour Party much embarrassment and forcing two by-elections which could have serious political ramifications for the Labour Party, both locally and nationally. But let's make sure we are clear on the law first. The Electoral Commission, the governing body for UK election practice, makes it very clear in their guidance for candidates that the home address of any candidate must be stated in full and must be the current home address of the candidate and not a business address. Here is the Electoral Commission guidance in full, and I quote, the home address form must state your home address in full. If you do not want your address to be made public and appear on the ballot paper, you must make a statement to this effect on the home address form and give the name of the constituency in which your home address is situated or, if you live outside the UK, the name of the country in which you reside. Your home address must be completed in full must not contain abbreviations, must be your current home address, must not be a business address unless you run a business from your home. Your address does not need to be in the constituency in which you intend to stand." End quote. However, despite this clear breach of the rules that govern elections and a police investigation into the Labour candidate for this breach, the BBC are refusing to cover the issue, despite giving Dan Jarvis wall-to-wall -wall coverage before the electoral period commenced. But why are the BBC refusing to cover this? Well, the BBC has offered the utterly pathetic excuse that covering the story may put Dan Jarvis and his family at risk. This was the excuse offered in private correspondence between a BBC employee and an individual who reported the police investigation of this suspected breach of electoral law to the BBC. But for the BBC to refuse to cover the story all seems very hypocritical. As last year, the BBC enthusiastically covered a very similar story involving the then leader of UKIP, Paul Nuttall. Paul was standing in a by-election in Stoke, and the BBC ran with the following headline, and I quote, Police probe over UKIP leader Paul Nuttall house claims. Police are investigating claims by the Labour Party that UKIP leader Paul Nuttall rented a house to mislead by-election voters about his home address. On Wednesday, Labour said Mr Nuttall, a candidate for Stoke-on-Trent Central MP, used a house he had yet to stay in as his home address on nomination papers. Now, political website Guido Fawkes has reported Mr Nuttall spent the night on a mattress on the floor of the house. End quote. So here we have the BBC, the UK's state broadcaster, showing exactly how impartial they really are. Whilst they were eager to run a story 
about an investigation by the police into a UKIP candidate for suspected electoral fraud relating to a possible false home address on his election paperwork, the BBC are unwilling to run exactly the same story when it relates to a police investigation into a Labour Party candidate and sitting Member of Parliament. This is just one striking, very obvious and clear example of the BBC's hypocrisy and the lack of impartiality. The BBC will always go out of its way to protect those pushing a liberal or leftist point of view but will ferociously attack and attempt to undermine those pushing for patriotism and traditionalism, to the point where the BBC is willing to cover up suspected criminality by Labour Party candidates. But covering up criminality is nothing new for this corporation, which has a long and shameful history of covering up child abuse and protecting paedophiles who work for the corporation. In a time when British politicians, the British media and even the BBC have attacked news outlets like Russia Today over daring to present alternative views on news and current affairs, it's interesting to see that one of the biggest threats to impartiality in British journalism is in fact the BBC and the British public are forced into paying over £3.7 billion a year to be lied to and to be misled. Now I can't tell you not to pay your TV licence, as that would be asking people to break the law. However, I implore all of my viewers and listeners to look into alternatives to the television and legal ways around paying a licence fee. As the quicker we defund the BBC and run that horrible corporation out of business, the better. The British public should not be paying an annual tax to fund a company that peddles fake news and covers up alleged wrongdoings by leftist elected officials. I also suggest that everyone who thinks this is an important issue, please share this podcast with your friends and family and help to expose this hypocrisy. You can also read more about this case on Robin Tilbrook's blog. He is a solicitor and the leader of the English Democrats, and he was the first to bring this issue to the public's attention. The link to his blog is in the description below. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please help spread the message by liking and sharing it on social networks. If you want to hear more from me, please hit the subscribe button, as new videos are posted every week. You can also read my book, The Fall of Western Man. It's available as a free ebook and in both hardback and paperback, and all the links are in the description below. Finally, if you want to join in the discussion with me, feel free to add me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter. Also, you can now follow me on Gab, Minds, and BitChute as well. Everyone's welcome.